Welcome everybody. Good to be with you. Good to see you all. Yes, uh, I know many of you have heard many times, but I'm going to encourage you to sign up for the retreat this May. It's 2023, May 12th through the 14th. Uh, we'd love to have you. That's in um, it's about a month here. So uh, looking forward to, to hosting that. So right now, I'm going to invite us all just to, to close down our eyes. And let us begin to breathe together. Just feeling into our body and feeling into our nervous system. And I want you just to notice from a place of mindfulness, from a place of love, where in you right now, could use a little compassion. If you just gently scan the body, the nervous system, we're just gently asking this question where within me could use a little bit of love, a little bit of support. And just taking some deep and full breaths there softening and trusting as you breathe in and breathe out. Being with your experience in a conscious way, perhaps for the first time this day. That's why I invite you to connect a little more deeply with your heart. The gentleness of your heart, the innocence of your heart, the purity of your heart. Inviting it to grow and to expand. Just sending a quiet blessing of strength throughout your body. Quiet blessing of strength, of love, going up to your head and blessing your mental center and your mind, flowing down to your belly, your hara, awakening the hara, it's your center of strength and power, of Buddha nature. Blessing the pelvis and the pelvic floor. Blessing the legs and the feet. I invite you just to notice if there's anywhere within you that is suffering. So can we embrace this with love? With compassion, kindness. Breathing more fully and completely. Into this space, wherever it is. Wherever it may be. Softening, opening, and awakening to the goodness of your being. Perhaps noticing a spaciousness in your mind, not paying attention to any thoughts, but noticing the space in which thoughts arise. This quiet love flowing throughout the entirety of your body. Quiet strength of Buddha nature. Or sometimes on the path we identify with pain, with suffering. Sometimes we identify with allergies or being sick or having a cold. Or Sometimes we identify 
too intensely with our political party or and we got we were hurt by our partner we've been hurt by our family in this moment i'm going to invite you just to love all the parts of yourself to see yourself your true self as strong as noble as awake and free So re-identifying with your divinity. And as you feel into your humanity, again, we're including this with love, but I want you to see clearly what you are, this divinity. And just acknowledging the temporary parts of yourself, the human parts, are just that, they're temporary. They're passing, they're changing, they morph, they grow, they expand, sometimes they diminish, sometimes they dissolve. And can you take a deep breath and get rooted? in your innate divinity. Your innate divinity is the second coming. So when they talk about Jesus coming again, it's really the Christ is coming in the form of you waking up to you, you realizing who you are as the Christ, you realizing who you are as Buddha nature. So softening and trusting, and if you like, you can open your eyes. Well, most of us suffer on this path and in this world because we identify way too much with the contents of our mind. We identify with the character a character who has been hurt and beat up in this world, a character who, again, maybe is sick or like me in this moment, has allergies. <laughs> and if we just identify with a character, things can get really heavy, really dense, or really excited, we can get really lost. If we just take a couple steps back, into that which sees the character. And if we just forget about the character for a moment, but instead of seeing the character, if we see ourselves, we see ourselves as light, as spaciousness, as this depth of soul, this depth of being, things really begin to change, radically begin to shift. Now, this is the path of spiritual awakening. This is the path of truth, is you stepping back into the truth. Into the truth, in seeing and living from the truth. I'm going to tell you a, a story that um, you, know, you may or may not think is funny. I think it's kind of funny. When I first started um, teaching and, and meeting with people, I can remember um, one day I woke up and I had all these very intense thoughts of suicide. And I was like quite shocked. I said, gosh, here I am. I've had like all kinds of spiritual realizations. And I'm just waking up this morning. You know, I had a great day the day before, whatever that day was. And I woke up this one morning and I had all these thoughts of ending my life. And 
because I was rooted in a space of mindfulness and, and a, a deeper sense of awareness, I wasn't totally identified with the character. I thought, geez, this is kind of strange. <laughs> this is kind of strange. Like I don't, you know, being suicidal hasn't really been my thing. It hasn't really been my thing. Me, I don't, my mind doesn't really go to suicide. My mind normally goes to the beach. That's <laughs> where it goes. Or, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to the desert, you know, like where I just came from. And this has happened a number of times throughout, uh, you know, this vocation that I have where I just wake up and I'm just all of a sudden plagued by these just overwhelming thoughts of wanting to end my life. And then normally uh, when I show up to work, in the olden days, I saw a lot of people in person, but now pretty much everyone's online. But you now at this, the first time I went into work and the first person I met with, you know, the last time I saw them, all they wanted to talk to me about was spiritual awakening. And then this particular day, all they wanted to talk to me about was ending their life. And then I had another person after them <laughs> who wanted to talk to me about how hard their life was and how they were thinking about ending their life. And I really, really began to see the power of the collective. I really began to see that the thoughts that sometimes are in this consciousness aren't even my thoughts. Now, most everyone, if they have a thought, they identify with that thought, they think this is my thought, and they take it a step further. They think that this is an aspect of me. This is how I am. Now, I can tell you, my teacher, he warned me about this. He warned me. He said, Craig, you know, be careful about how many people you see in a day. Don't overdo it because sometimes you'll take on, you know, a little too much of their energy. And please, um, I don't want anyone to walk away from this teaching scared of taking on people's energy. This is a part of life here on planet Earth. What's important is to be, a, to be wise about it. Wise. The more you know yourself, the more you, you are able to stay clear, the less these things will disturb you. The less these things will disturb you. And so I can tell you this, the first time it happened it was more of a shock. It didn't really disturb me that much. It was more just like, huh, this is very strange because I was feeling pretty good. Now, later in life, uh, let's say a couple of years later, you know, I was working a lot. Things were very stressful, say with my family or my kids or something I can remember. Things were just hard. I was just, you know, a little, little more stressed than usual and having a hard time. And there was some suffering within my family system. And again, I woke up and had these thoughts. And when I had these thoughts the second time, because I was stressed within just the day-to-day -day events of my own life, I started to believe these thoughts. But again, I thought they were a little peculiar <laughs> because this wasn't, again, suicide's not really my style. Um, but the thoughts got a little deeper in me and I had to work with them a little more be able to see them clearly and have them empty out of my consciousness. And so if we want to be awake here on planet Earth, we have to know who we are in our divinity. And most people think to know who they are is to know who they are in their humanity. And I place great value in knowing who you are in your humanity. And I place great value in knowing who you are in your shadow. So it's good to know these parts of the self. But I place a much greater value in knowing who you are in your divinity. 
when you know who you are in your divinity, it is very easy to stay sane. It's very easy to stay rooted and grounded. But when you don't know who you are in your divinity, it's very easy to be taken away or carried away by what the Buddha would call a mind storm. And just throughout our life, there's all kinds of mind storms, all kinds of mind storms. Now, some people have um, hormonal mind storms. You know, I was talking with a friend this week and he said that his, his wife went through uh, menopause, like when she was like 32 years old, you know, something crazy. And uh, it's actually a common thing uh, where I live because uh, there's a lot of uh, people who are like ultra runners, ultra athletes, and they have zero body fat. And with women, if you have just like, like zero body fat, um, it's very bad for you hormonally. So you stop making estrogen and uh, you can go into menopause real early and have trouble having a baby and all that kind of stuff. First, you have trouble having a baby, and then you go into menopause early, but to make sure we get that math right. But, um, you know, like sometimes we go, sometimes if we're a teenage or teenage boy, you know, we can have a hormonal mind storm. Uh, sometimes, you know, like in the last uh, election cycle, pretty much everyone had a political mind storm that we went through we went through you know COVID was you know a real mind storm I was uh in the hot springs today after I got home from the desert I met my family at the hot springs and I was hanging out in this tub with a lady and she was still in the COVID you know vaccine mind storm she kept telling me how many shots she had and she wanted to make sure that I had four at least four vaccines and I was like my Lord, <laughs> not gonna make this, not gonna make this lady happy, you know. And when I told her how many I had, um, which I think is funny that people, you know, everyone's just like asking how many have you had a conversation I normally don't like to talk too much about, but she got up and left because <laughs> she was so upset, so upset with me. But before that, you know, she talked to me for like 35 minutes, was very happy to speak with me. But when she realized I wasn't on the same page with her, she, you know, walked away in her mind storm. Her mind storm. But these things, these things happen. But we get in these storms, we get in these states of confusion. In a sense, like when we're in the dark night, we can have one giant storm or the dark night could be a series of storms. When I went through the dark night, it was, you know, a storm of emotional loss. I lost my, my first family and a marriage and relationships and friendships. And I was in a financial storm <laughs> because I was left utterly broke. Uh, I was in a kundalini storm because I had so much energy flowing through my body. And I was in an overwhelmed storm just because too many things were happening at once. But to be spiritually awake, some people think, think that means to feel really good and blissful, to feel that you are made of love and light and space and peace. And there is a truth to that. But to be spiritually awake means you are rooted in your divinity. Whether there is a storm, a mind storm, and you feel really good, or it can mean that you're rooted in your divinity and you're walking through hell. You're walking through hell. And so I encourage you to look 
yourself and your experience of what you know yourself to be. And so instead of identifying with feelings, which like the Buddha taught, like Ramada taught, like St. Teresa taught, feelings come and go. Can you be with that quiet voice of sanity? Whether you are having the most wonderful, blissful experience or the most wild, crazy, frightening experience. The wild, crazy, frightening experience. You know, I hate to say this, but I'm just going to use this as a terrible metaphor. Like, what if when I woke up, you know, one of those mornings, I heard the voice of suicidal ideation? Like, what if I believed in that? Like, what if I ended my life? Of course, that would have been a terrible mistake because those thoughts weren't even mine. <laughs> they weren't even my thoughts. They didn't belong to me. I was just so intuitively connected to the people I work with that some of their thoughts were coming into me. And, you know, I can even say it happened uh, it happened again last week where I woke up with these thoughts. I said, huh, what's going on? What's going on? You're going to have to excuse me for a moment here. I went out to the, uh, the desert on uh, this weekend and uh, all the uh, desert uh, flowers, and the sage, and, uh, the pinion trees, or the juniper trees, all of them are pollinating right now. So I had some serious allergies all of a sudden. Uh, so you have to forgive me for my voice. So my question to you is, do you know who and what you are in the deepest part of yourself, in the truth. Do you know who and what you are on a soul level? Can you see your life from the perspective of your soul? See that you have certain contracts perhaps to go through, difficult things, difficult situations. to see what your life is about. And so that's kind of looking from the vast view. And then if you turn awareness upon itself, as the Buddha taught, so instead of just being mindful, again, of the contents of your mind or even the journey of your soul, if you turn awareness upon itself, can you see this quiet spaciousness, this gentle light, this deep indestructible presence? Can you see that this is what you are? Your most fundamental nature. And can you give yourself permission to enjoy the quiet sanity of this? And one of the ways the Buddha taught was you know, the, the true teachings of the Buddha were teachings where there were no real fireworks. This is why most people miss like, the true teachings of the Buddha. If the Buddha's realization was that of this quiet space of emptiness, that is free, that is unentangled, that is perfectly sane. Most people, when they look at that, they don't know what it is. They don't know what it is, and so they keep looking. They look for little bits of bliss, little bits of shakti, little bits of really good feelings. 
And again, like when you truly let go into true nature, it feels really good. Like there's a, a truth to that. But what's here that's deeper than feelings, even really good feelings? What's here that can sit through, that can live through life and death in an absolutely sane way? Because most of us during the course of our life, we might have some very crazy, wild, bizarre, overwhelming, heartbreaking experiences. Heartbreaking experiences. And so what is it within you that cannot be broken? What is that thing? Do you know that thing that cannot be broken? Do you know that thing that cannot be broken? Can you surrender to this? It's a thing that cannot be broken. It's what you need when you walk through the dark night. It's also the thing you need when you're overwhelmed and seduced <laughs> by beautiful spiritual feelings. It's the thing that you need when you're overwhelmed and seduced by the wildness of life. The wildness of life. You know, I, I just had a friend uh, and she's been, she's, she's an older lady. She's been seduced by Las Vegas <laughs> for, for a good part of her life. And, uh, you know, throughout the year, whenever she gets a couple of days off work, she runs to Vegas to see if she can you know, hit the jackpot. <laughs> she can make her million bucks or maybe it's 10 million. Maybe it's a billion. I don't know what people want these days, but she's been seduced by that so many times. And uh, I ran into a friend of a friend the other day and they said, you know, I said, well, what's so-and-so doing? They said, oh, she just got a job and she's moving to Vegas. And I said, oh boy, that would be a good time to step back into her holy divine nature and look and see, is that a good idea for me? Or is my shadow ruling me? Is my shadow ruling me? Is my shadow ruling me? What is it? What is it that's ruling me? Is it my mask? Is it my mask that's ruling me? You know, I can tell you, uh, you know, a funny story. We, we had a, a big laugh this weekend because I was out uh, in the desert. Maybe I can, maybe I can show you. Uh, let's see if I can pull it up on my phone. We were out in the desert and uh, we were camping. As I'll show you like what my camp spot looked like. Let's see if I can do this properly. All right, so like this is where I was camping out in the desert. And as you can see, it was a very blue sunny sky when we got in and um, you know, at some point, uh, you know, all the guys said, well, let's, let's not go rock climbing today. Let's just go for a, a hike. And the crew I was with are professional climbers. And, you know, so we just packed a little pack and a little lunch. And we were going to hike on top of this mountain and see some petrified wood and some dinosaur footprints and just have like an easy, easy day. And we were all just laughing and having fun. And, an hour later, um, you know, we drove over to the mountains and an, and an hour later, 
um, this climbing expedition that, you know, again, like these guys, they could be on, you know, like a North Face team. Uh, a couple of them are on the La Sportiva team. And so they've been on expeditions all over the world. And, uh, but maybe an hour and a half later, we found ourselves in a snowstorm, <laughs> uh, totally wet, totally caught off guard, freezing. And all of us, we took off our masks, you know, our masks of being tough. These guys took off their masks of, you know, being pro climbers and can doing, you know, who can climb Mount Everest or whatever, get to the top of anything. And all of us were just, just laughing and crying about what a big mess we got in because we were sopping wet. And it was just, it was just so funny. It was funny just to be human, not to have to be tough, not to have to prove anything from the perspective of a mask. You know, we just said, boy, did we really um, just drop the ball and get confused, bite off more than we could chew. And that's the beautiful thing about nature. Is nature sometimes will put you in your place. It'll help you take off your mask. I'll take off your mask. And like some of us, like, like me, I wasn't really dressed properly. I was wearing jeans and, you know, I had on a hoodie. I didn't have like proper um, snow gear or anything. And then, you know, my friends who are uh, professionals, one of them, uh, he dressed like me in jeans and a hoodie. And then the other one, she had on her full, you know, whatever Patagonia mountaineering gear. All of us <laughs> were totally wet, <laughs> whether we were wearing, you know, the wrong thing, blue jeans or wearing a $300 pair of backpacking pants. All of us were soaking wet. And that storm, it just cut through our masks, you know, cut through our clothes, it cut through, you know, any kind of ego that says, I need to get to the top of that mountain. And at some point, we all pulled the plug. And we just turned around and went home and uh, almost got hypothermia, but didn't. But didn't. And that's one of the beautiful things that I love about nature. It points out your strengths. It points out your weaknesses. It doesn't allow for you to maintain a mask. Sometimes it just throws a big wet snowball on April 14th. <laughs> on your parade, on your expedition, send you home. We went back home and, you know, we were so miserable on the hike. All of us were laughing again, like that's a mind storm where sometimes the mind storms come from weather. As soon as we got back to the campsite, it was as sunny as could be, as warm as could be. And this was just, you know, 15 miles away. It's just funny. The mountains can be like that. We all took off our wet clothes and and uh, put on some warm clothes and you know, climb some different rocks and saw the sunset. Had a good old time. Had a good old time. And so it's a great question to ask is, what is your mask? And is your mask upholding a big, excuse my language, but like a big fat egoic nature? Are we upholding pride? Some of us, like we have the prince archetype or the princess. We have the, you know, the archetypal nature of I'm the best. I know everything. You know, I'm the savior. Some of us have, the, you know, one of the guys on the expedition who's, it's hilarious. He's a, again, like another professional climber. He, he has uh you know an archetypal nature of of the worst <laughs> it's like you know i i point out to him that the mask that he's seen life through that like the lenses is not the truth because he is this climber who is so incredible and he talks about himself as he's the worst all the time i say you don't have to do that it's okay to to see yourself for what you are, to see the strength that you are. Some of us hide behind being the best. 
that some of us hide behind the worst. And it is funny because I have a, a couple now, friends who are professional climbers, and one is so puffed up and flamboyant about these the best, and the the other one, this other one is so down on himself. I'm like, hey, <laughs> hey, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. And they're both great. The one who's puffed up is he 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 actually sees more clearly. <laughs> But his puffed up nature helps him, helps him to expand. So I'm not even saying that's wrong. But it's important to look. Look at what is your mask? Is your mask the I'm the broken one? I cannot do this. I'm the child. No one has suffered as much as I have. No one will understand me. So how are we looking out at life? From what perspective? Can we look out at life instead without a mask? Without a mask. Like one of the days I went, I packed up all my gear and we hike up. Uh, yeah, let me see if I can show you how it kind of works so I go climbing. We have to, we have to kind of hike up to the base of the climb which is uh, a couple hundred feet up let me see if i got a good picture here i shouldn't do this when i'm trying to uh, but uh yeah so if you can see this uh i hold it up so our climbs that we do actually start up here like like actually right here and they go up but there's this whole pile of rock that we have to walk you know sometimes a couple miles uh you know up the side of the mountain to get to the place where it is a vertical wall and um you know so i packed up all my gear and uh, you know i went with my crew and i got up to the the base of the vertical wall and Gosh, my allergies were so bad. I was having some long COVID symptoms. And here I was with all my climbing gear and everything that I carried up and everyone was climbing. And they said, Craig, are, are you going to climb? And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to. I think I'm just going to lay here on the side of the mountains and be nothing, be no one. I don't need to prove anything. I didn't need to prove anything to my friends. I didn't need to prove anything to myself. I, I did, you know, big climbs last weekend. I can just lay here for the day and just enjoy the clouds and be empty. Be absolutely empty. Be absolutely empty. You know, and so we can ask ourselves, like, is it okay? They've had different periods of life. We're not the center of attention. Different periods of life that we, is it okay if we fail? Fail to do whatever it is that we thought we were going to do. Is that okay? And when you live in this space and no self, it's okay to be how you are whatever moment it is so if you're sick it's okay to be sick if you're nothing it's okay to be nothing if you're going to be something it's okay to be that but we're not attached to any of it not attached to any of it we're not even trying to be unattached we're just being the space and following the intelligence of the space so my mind had a big plan of a big day climbing, but the consciousness that I am said, we're going to do nothing today. So I said, okay, I'll listen to that. I'll listen to that. I had a lovely time. Okay, so if anyone has a question and want to bring it forward, you can raise your hand. For those of you who are new, you press the reactions button at the bottom of the screen. And 
Again, I am so far behind in my emails, maybe three weeks. So if you've emailed me, I do not have your question. Uh, I, did, I did pick up one question from email uh, that I just saw pop up, but let's hear from Anne real quick. Uh, let me see if I can unmute you, Anne. Uh, and if you do ask a question, I just ask that it's short, clear, and correct. Uh, uh, correct. Short, clear, and direct, please. And I apologize. I'm a little, a little grog groggy from the all the pollen and getting a little cooked in the sun. Okay, are you here, Ann? Yes, I'm here. Hey, good to see you. Yes. Just... So, so Ann, uh, let me just say this. Uh, I'm going to email you tonight uh, about oh. some about something for tomorrow and so just be on the lookout for that and if I forget you email me and just say Craig you were supposed to get a hold of me about something oh good okay good good That's so anyways great. what's uh what's on your mind well I haven't seen you and I've been thinking about you climbing and um and I just want to ask you when you're climbing are you on a rope or do you have like some protection or are you just free climbing up or, or are you like on a rope? Yeah, I mean, most of the time I'm on a rope. Yeah, most of the time. But, you know, then there's times when we, um, we're not going to climb, we're not going to climb much <laughs> without a rope uh, if it could kill us, you know. So almost always, like when I'm doing those big climbs, we certainly have a rope. And we have uh, uh, these things, um, uh, they're called cams. They're like this device you stick it. Like, so I climb these cracks and basically it's a device you stick into the crack and it gets a little bigger. And when you're going up, it'll catch the rope if you, ha if you have and it. You, and then you hold, uh, and then you have, you can hold. Yeah, you don't, you're not, don't worry about me dying, okay? And if well, I, I was die, just gonna say, I, I, I know. <laughs> I started, I started to go that way a little bit, you know. But then you were talking about it, and I just got the big picture of the desert and all of that. And I'm just like, yes, it's it's really good. And I think, you know, how you were saying you were taking on the thing, you know, somebody, your client. And I think that this desert is, Craig, I can think, like my brain is working now. Yeah. And I think it's because of this desert. Yeah. And I'm very happy. Like Good. there's a lot of clarity. Good. So um, it's just, I guess it's, that was my question. I'll talk to you more about it later. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, so I think one of the things that I was saying is like, there's times in the path where like your brain doesn't work and you can't think and like the thinking goes away and that can be very disconcerting for a lot of people. And now you're saying that uh, your thinking is coming back online and it's coming back online with a greater sense of clarity. Good, good. Yeah, and that yeah. Makes, you, makes you smile. And for most of us, that, that gives us a sense of relief. But that's one of those mind storms that we go through is sometimes and it happened with me where God takes your mind away from you and it could be very bizarre, very confusing. But again, if we stay with that quiet state of sanity, we just notice, wow, I'm having trouble thinking. I'm having trouble with, you know, my words and putting documents together and all that kind of stuff, accounting. It's okay, I'm noticing that. But what is it that can notice that? What is it that notices it? And sometimes we have to press the pause button on our life on you know, the business and those types of things. But if you stay sane, then it's less, you know, it's less troublesome. If you stay just rooted in that quiet state of clarity, then it doesn't have to be such a big deal. But if we're really identified with our mind, you know, then a lot of people go into, I have Alzheimer's or I have some disorder, or there's something wrong with me. And, and we can get, you know, really spun into a crazy place. So. So anyways, well, it's good to see you. Anything else you want to share? 
Um, no, it, no, not right now. Okay. Yeah. 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 I just, I'm happier climbing. Yeah, I'm me too. <laughs> me too. It's, it feels good to be out in the desert. So, so thank you. Much love. Good to see you. All right. Okay. Let's hear from, uh, let's see. Let's see the Don and Jan. And uh, let's see if we can press these buttons. Hey, Craig. Thank you. Hey. Yeah, I just want to say, yeah, and I remember she seems so much lighter and, and open from last time we saw her. It's wonderful that the change. Yeah. To, yeah. I wanted to thank you. Um, wonderful, inspiring talk, the collective mind storms. And I love the having compassion from our innate goodness to find what needs compassion. I just want to have a brief sharing. Um, yeah. So I think this is very much related. So last night, Jen and I had dinner with some friends. We were out in the mountains, a little Biltmore State, and this beautiful night. And our friend mentioned she's been studying with this guy who did a very intense sadhana for about 40 years and seemed to have a gen genuine awakening. And he teaches basically the sort of impersonal no self. You know, you investigate where is the apparent I, and you see there's no I there, you could have fallen to no self. And I had actually seen a chapter of his manuscript he showed me a couple of years ago, maybe not a touch, and she said he, he just published his book. So I got home and I downloaded it on my Kindle and I'm reading it. And I'm realizing my mind is very attracted to this. It's very simple, it's something you can do. And I'm feeling my heart is saying, this is not, this is not my path. Yeah. And so I put the book down and I sat back and said, what is my heart saying I need right now? And I felt again, I've had this dissolving thing the last few years, and it's usually happened with a lot of fear. And I felt the fear come up and said, I don't know where this is taking me, but let it go. And I felt myself dissolving to the sort of field of energy and the silence kind of surrounding. And through the night, I kept, and I'd wake up to the bathroom, I'd sort of be walking, sort of moving through this field. Yeah. It's interesting. So the way this comes back to what you're talking about tonight is, Jan and I are really at this place where we, we're under, we're sort of putting ourselves under so much pressure because we're just about ready in a few days to deliver our, all of our website and everything to our marketing person. And we've been having, we've been together 30 years and if we have any argument any other way, way, it's like over in five or 10 minutes we can talk it through. But when we work, it's like, you know, we'll say like, okay, do you want to be right or want to be married? I want to be right, you know, so we get stuck in that. And yeah. we'll start the work day saying, okay, let's meditate, we'll be quiet, you know. So this morning, for me, it was partly being in that presence. It was so interesting. So Jan came into my workroom and she saw it first. She asked me a question and I was very anxious and reactive. And she got reactive and then she stopped. She said, you know, I realize I'm being reactive and I'm not saying this is you, but I, what I felt was when you were anxious, you were judging me. Yeah. Somehow in that, you, this is back to the theme you said, like when you step back into your truer self, you can have the, the space to see what needs compassion. Like this scared part of me is, no, we can't do this. We've got to get this done. And she kind of gave me, this, gave me this space to stop. And I could say, yeah, I, I was unfairly judgmental. I yeah. was and this happened later with her and we went back and forth with here in her workroom. I just want to say back to the collective thing, the collective mindset can be negative, but there's this collective energy of this, this satsang. I definitely felt like, you know, we're both so involved in the satsang that we're here working on this. And our, our course theme is very similar to in some ways what you teach. And so we're here being supported by the satsang, where I'm feeling also your emphasis so much on the fully human is that I think we're both, you know, I, I Jan can speak for, for herself, but we're both feeling so much more comfortable being, you know, spiritual aspirants with all these flaws. Yeah. But yeah. that was really, really, really appreciative. Like, oh, I can really relax about being stubborn and narcissistic and angry and reactive and it's like really a grace to not identify with that and yeah. to be loving 
uh, supportive thing with you guys, everyone here, and Jan and I can kind of, you know, invite each other to hold that space. So I'm just kind of a, a note of deep appreciation. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. I mean, that's, that was a beautiful share, a beautiful share. And so what, what are the things about, um, you know, like the path of, let's say, no self, if we make it very, uh, very human, which is normally what teachers don't do. <laughs> Most teachers, when they talk about no self, they make it very inhuman, but I want to make it very human. Like when you step into the space of no self, you're able to see the mask that's here and you're able to see it from a place of love. You're not holding on to it. You're not guarding it. You know, so when someone gives you feedback, you receive it. Someone says, hey, you know, you're being agitated or let's have some fun. Hey, you're being a jerk. You're foolish. Oh, my gosh, I am foolish. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for pointing this out to me. Thank you for pointing this out to me. And, and you truly mean it. You truly mean it because they're helping you to wake up further. They're helping you to see the parts of self that are still suffering, that are holding on, that are confused. Like if we truly are invested in the quote unquote, the truth, and we take feedback and we take it very seriously. But most of us, we're not, you know, on the path of truth. We're on the path, like you said, of being right. We want to be right and we want to be extra guarded. We're extra defended. You know, like I've been to all kinds of spiritual groups where there's intense pecking orders and, you know, people who want to be the best and they're fighting for guru's grace and all that kind of stuff. Like they're fighting for a seat at the table. And, you know, there, there's all these power dynamics that are going on. And it's like, that's not, that's not no self. That's lots of self. <laughs> like that's, that's, that's lots of self. And, and we have to be willing you know, if we want to know this thing called no self, to be vulnerable, to be naked, to see clearly what's here that's within us. Because the things that are within us that we trip over, someone points that out, that's good news. That's good news. And so that's, that's one perspective. Like another perspective, uh, which I like is like when we look out at like if we look at life from an evolutionary perspective, like so much of our evolution comes through failing again and again and again. And so when we get very comfortable with failure, we get comfortable with failure, it creates this great sense of humility. And in this space of humility, there's a freedom a freedom for your humanness to be human. Like you're seeing reality as it is. You're seeing that we were given these emotions. One of them is sadness. Another one is anger. Another one might be, you know, jealousy or heartache or despair. Like we were given these as programs. And so when we can step back and see that and not be so attached to it, but you see, like, see that this is within us. That this is in the fabric of humanity, is in the fabric of the collective. Right. When when the collective arises within us, when conditioning arises within us, we don't judge it so harshly. And there's this beautiful thing about judgment is when you see something and you don't judge it harshly, often it will leave you very quickly. Mm -hmm. But when we judge it harshly, saying this should not be here, right. you know, then it comes out in weird ways, you know? And unfortunately, like a lot of, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but many priests have been guilty of this. They judge so harshly, you know, this human desire for intimacy and they repress it, repress it, repress it. Then it comes out in a horrific way because they've judged it so harshly and it's gotten more rooted within their consciousness. And so when we can look at ourselves and say, oh yeah, like I have all of creation within me. 
That's one of the things Aurobindo says. You find everything within him. Right. All of life. All of life. You know what you said? His consciousness, yeah. But just last thing, you, you struck me when you said about failing over and over again. There's another thing that Jan pointed out. There had been an email program that I had failed at repeatedly for months, about a year ago. So when we had to come back to it, our, our marketing person said, you got to try it. Yeah. And so I had this conditioning. This is a nightmare. It's not going to work. I can't do this. Yeah. And Jan could, could see that from outside and say, you're not trusting yeah. that as an intelligence. And I, you yeah. know, at first I'll go like, no, I can't do it. And she kept coming back, you're not trusting. And, sort of, and you're yeah. right. Once I let go of the judgment and the conditioning and the, you know, it's like, okay, this is an old conditioned reaction. Yeah. I don't have to believe it. So that, yeah, that's very helpful. Yeah, and that's the beautiful thing. And that that's one of the things about the intelligence of the divine. Sometimes the intelligence divine will actually have us fail at something on purpose to bring forth the judgment, to bring forth this moment when Jan says, hey, like, <laughs> you know, this is really about trust. And then you see, oh, oh, so even failure yeah. is a legitimate part of the path. It's a legitimate you know, avenue that the divine uses. I mean, how it's a huge aspect of Christianity, of course, of just, you know, this failure of Jesus, you know, to continue living on in human form in this world. It's like, no, no, he had to die. Like he had to suffer. He had to be dragged through the streets. And so you see that even failure can be used by the divine and that when that starts to happen it really does some tricks in our egoic nature because the ego has all these ideas that you know if i'm doing everything right everything will fall into place and i'll be in the flow and everything will go greatly you no know, sometimes you're doing everything right and you're just hitting wall after wall after wall of failure and god's trying to break us down god is trying to break us down so we can be more fully opened up Beautiful. This is one of the things like the ego doesn't like these types of teachings, but you know, again, it's like, do we want the truth or do we want to hold on to some imagined life should be easy and life should be perfect? And, you know, do we want it to be our way or do we want it to be God's way? If we want to be awake, we bow before God's way. So anyways, uh, good to see you both. You know, good to see you both. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Now let's hear from John. John, are you here? Yes, I am, Greg. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, I just yeah. woke up in time to catch the end. No, of I saw episode. you. I saw you popped in. And I I got your email. Yeah. I was going to respond to your email, but let, let me see. So I want you to ask me a short, clear question, and because uh, you're you're good at writing me long emails, so I want it short, yeah. clear, and direct, and. And we'll go from there. I already have a response. You tell me. Okay. I don't know where I am with my energy and this teacher I've been telling you about. Yeah. Uh, I participated in a Zoom meeting with him and the, uh, the group uh, earlier this evening. And uh, the, I can feel that the energy really moved inside me um oh now, and, now hold on a second john i'm i'm confused so the last time you emailed me you were telling me you want to get you wanted to get away from this teacher you thought yeah, it was fraudulent yeah 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 i'm okay i know i'm bouncing around here um i had some i had some really bizarre experiences and to me really unpleasant experiences earlier this week and i stopped doing his meditations and yeah. it just didn't i didn't really click that this was a dangerous thing for me to do yeah, uh, so, continue. I, so I'm going to tell you this, John. Um, I'm just going to be blunt with you. Yeah, I have received so much terrible feedback about this one particular <clears throat> teacher. I don't want to say his name. I don't want you to say his name because I don't want to right. get okay. that, that type of game. And that there's a lot of, let's say, sorcery, trickery, mind games, manipulation. And so I, I wouldn't want anyone to be around that kind of thing ever okay right and so when that's Fine, the, so when that's the case what's important for you is for you to cut the cords yeah for you to find something that you do like and plug into something good now 
you keep showing up here. And so, of course, I think what's here is good, <laughs> but I want you to feel in yeah. your heart. And so if you like what's here, I encourage you to stay with what's here. Uh, yes. I'm not trying to sell anything to you here, but uh, if you like what's here, stay with what's here. I can tell you it's it's sane. You know, I'm not going to play any games with you. You know, I'm yeah. not going to do the manipulation that I hear goes on with this, this other fella. But sometimes teachers have a lot of energy. Yes. And that energy can be very seductive. Can be very mm -hmm. seductive. And we can get uh we can get seduced by energy, by power. And I, I can tell you, like when I was young, there was I had my teacher who was excellent, but there was also this other teacher who I really liked a lot. Uh, he had lots of power, lots of shakti, and I'd, sometimes I'd go and do little retreats with him. But on the retreats, often he would attack the students and start playing games with them. And, you know, he would do, do all this bizarre stuff with his students. And he always, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, he always justified it as crazy wisdom or this and that. He had all kinds of words of why he was doing teaching in this way yeah but uh and my teacher used to say he said craig you know be careful with this one he's you know he said you know go see whoever you want but just be careful with this one there's something a little off and i knew there was something a little off and then you know a couple years later um people were making documentaries about him <laughs> about what a okay. what a mm -hmm. horrific person he was and the terrible <laughs> things he did to them and the manipulation and the games and the things with money and it just again like what i want you to do john is i want you to feel that whatever path you're on like if you're studying with a teacher the big thing is i want you to be able to trust them as a human being if you that's can right trust them yeah. and your heart feels good you know and you feel like this is my path then you go forward but if mm -hmm. you fundamentally like don't trust this person and you've wrote written me a bunch of emails saying in different ways you're not trusting this person you yeah know, then I, I encourage you to listen to your gut first and foremost despite all the shakti right despite all the shakti and again like shakti is very seducing i've been seduced by shakti but also i know at the end of the day uh a dangerous person is a dangerous person and, and basically in a situation like this like like more dangerous for females but with men often uh you know if we study with a you know a, a confused teacher they waste our time they waste our time and, and the reason i say with women it's more dangerous is because often there's um you know sexual advances yeah, and all that yeah. kind of stuff that goes on that just it creates so much suffering um and so I, I encourage you, like, if there's that kind of thing, you cut the cord and you move on and you say, okay, I learned, you know, I learned my lesson and that mm -hmm. okay, this isn't the thing for me. Well, I totally agree with you. This is not the thing for me. But what took me by surprise was the energetic element. Uh, I did, you know, I felt this can't be bad. But the fact, the truth of the matter is that I had some really horrendous experiences from following a practice which seemed to me to be perfectly you know seemed to be completely impeccable in terms of its uh, its uh, spiritual orientation but yeah. the guy i just don't trust you know so yeah and um, see that's uh, always so you're going to have seeds of doubt within your mind and then the, the other thing too is you know when you're with a spiritual teacher uh you know no one tells us this but like when you step into like a stream of a sangha so like a teacher, mm -hmm. like they have kind of this lineage with the Sangha. When we step into that stream, uh, we step into basically the consciousness of the teacher and whatever's going on in the consciousness of the teacher, like that can bleed over into our life. And so if they have shadow stuff, they may have, you know, some teachers have a very solid teaching and solid practices, but because of the, they put bits of their consciousness in it, some of that gets into us, it gets into our mind, and it creates a lot of confusion, you know, because the energy's off or something strange about it. And then yeah, we start yeah. doubting it. 
And then again, that's where there's just a lot of time that's wasted. And we're saying like, what, what the heck's going on here? Mm, exactly that. Yeah, exactly that. You know, and, and the big thing is, you know, I don't, you know, it's like, I don't want you wasting your time. Oh, you know, I feel you, I feel I'm in a, I feel I'm in a very dangerous place with this. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so when we're in a dangerous place, it's a good time to listen to your ego because you're, or just to a place of discernment. But whenever we're in danger, like I was walking up this mountain the other day, it started to snow, we got sopping wet. It's like, you know, it's like, if you ask the ego or if you ask the truth, what should I do? Time to go home. <laughs> you know, time to go home. You cut your losses and you go home. And, you know, even like if I look in the chat here, Justina wrote something that she wasted six years with an abusive spiritual teacher. Uh, I like the books. Uh, I like the books Halfway Up the Mountain, uh, Eyes Wide Open by Mariana Kaplan. These are helpful in building discernment about teachers. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's important to be with someone that you fundamentally feel safe with. Because if not, uh, you're going to have doubt the whole time. And if there's weird energy manipulation stuff that can really spend, uh, send your psyche into a tailspin. Yeah. And that, you know, sometimes that becomes a whole path in and of itself is healing the trauma of, <sighs> you know, whether it's two months or 10 years with, you know, a terrible teacher. Yeah. And sometimes that can be like a whole, <laughs> a whole oh, ordeal. And, and we don't need anything extra on the path, you know? No, 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 no. I'm just, yeah. well, I'm mortified, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm also very scared. So yeah. Thank God. But, uh, you know, I woke up in time to <laughs> get this, this uh, yeah. you know, sad thing. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so, the, the, you know, the big thing for you is, uh, and again, I'm not trying to sell myself or anything like that. I just want you to have a sense of if I don't trust them, you know, don't do business with them. You know, just don't okay. do business with them. I'd say the same thing with my daughter. Like if she's dating a, a young boy and, and she doesn't trust him, I'm like, now's the time to cut your losses. I <laughs> like, don't right. keep being seduced because he's handsome or he's got a lot of energy <laughs> or whatever it is. Like cut your losses and move on and and you know like for some of us on the path like if we struggle with a lot of mental confusion in our mind mm -hmm. sometimes these people will come into our life and they'll prey off that confusion and that type of thing other times we attract them and yeah. from a big picture perspective what god is wanting for you is for you to wake up and for you to listen to your gut not your mind not all the thinking but just listen to your gut if your gut says no then mm. again we cut our losses and we move to a place where we get a yes okay my friend thank you craig that's great yeah so so good to be with you john so good to be with okay. you yeah yeah and a deep bow of respect uh, for you for getting up in the middle of the night and showing up here uh okay uh here's one from kyle kyle writes a good friend of mine just changed his name to a spiritual name i have resistance to calling him by his new name and even not looking forward to spending time with him. <laughs> okay. I also have a friend who identifies, this is, this is hilarious, uh, as a nudist. And I told her I was uncomfortable that she goes hiking with me <laughs> without a shirt. I find it stressful to spend time with her and considering to tell her I no longer want, any friend, want to be friends. Any thoughts? Um yeah, Kyle. Okay, so so look, this you have two th two different things going on here. So, with your friend uh, who just changed his name, you know, I'd encourage you to look at why you have resistance to calling him by his new spiritual name. Now, I can tell you this that that. Um, this is a little bit silly, but when you live in a hippie town like I do, sometimes people will say, hey, my name is Brian, when you meet them. And then a month later, they're going to tell you their name is Moon Shadow. <laughs> and then uh, later on, their name is, you know, uh, whatever, Butterfly Flowers or something. It's just like some people are name changers. And the reason that makes us uncomfortable 
is normally because that human being doesn't have a solid sense of self. Now, on the spiritual path, that's normally a good thing when someone doesn't have a solid sense of self. But in a situation like what I'm describing, when someone's always changing their name, often that person is you know, a little bit insecure, a little bit spiritually immature, and they're trying to get their bearings. They're trying to try on some new costumes and you know, step into something through changing their name. Now, I can tell you in a funny way, uh, like I was given a Tibetan name uh, from one of my Tibetan teachers, and but she called me the Lion of the Dharma. Now, I don't know how to say my spiritual name in Tibetan. <laughs> so I don't ever use it. You know? It's like even very simple. You call me Craig. <laughs> you call me Craig. I don't know how to, how to pronounce you know, the Tibetan name. And so... Uh, I wasn't going to go home and tell all my friends, you need to call me this now. Uh, now, if someone changes their name once and that's the thing, it's like, well, that's great. Like we can adapt. We can be flexible. We can, you know, uh, we can call someone by their new name. I mean, one of my teachers, you know, Ajashanti, I have to think, what's his name? Stephen Gregg. Stephen Gregg, I think, is his name. Is his birth name. But he flowed into his name, and that's what people call him now, or they call him Ajya, and I'm very comfortable with that. And that's how I met him as Ajya. I didn't meet him as Stephen. Now, if someone's always changing their name, normally it's a sign that they're psychologically immature, or they're, they're trying to figure themselves out, which is similar to what happens in middle school and high school. You know, I can remember in, in middle school, like sometimes I'd wear camo pants because I was in a military family. And other times I wore hippie patchwork pants because <laughs> I was playing around with being a hippie. And other times I just wear jeans. And, you know, it's just like, ultimately, now I just wear what's comfortable. <laughs> and so, so, you know, this is something you're going to have to play with is to look at your resistance and are you resisting because you're inflexible or are you resisting because you see the person as spiritually immature and you don't actually trust their new name? You don't trust that they're going to stick with it. They're going to change it again and change it again and change it again. And you're just taking part in, you know, their, uh, their mask. And at some point, like sometimes we get sick of, you know, people who always change their mask. It's just like, hey, just pick a mask that works and stick with it, you know, but um, I invite you to look at that. Now, your friend who's a nudist, it's like, geez, I think most human beings would be uncomfortable with that. You know, it's like if you're with someone and they're always taking off their clothes, it's like, the heck's going on here? <laughs> you know, like, what's going on here? And you can say, like me, I'm I'm actually pretty conservative in this department. I'm not hanging out with the nudists. <laughs> you know, like that's not where I'm spending my time. You know, and so because you know I don't fully understand it. I don't fully understand what they're doing or where they're going with that. And so you could ask them. I mean, you could just ask them to put their, you know, keep their clothes on. Um, you'd ask them what their deal is. You know, you could be a psychologist and see like, what's, what's the situation here? You know, but ultimately, um, you know, it, it's, it sounds like you're probably looking for, like if we just look, forget about this question, we just step back and just look at what's going on with you instead of making both these people wrong. It's probably that you're looking for a good, solid, group of friends and when you have a good solid group group of friends on the spiritual path or just in life it is such a blessing it is such a blessing such a blessing and this might be you know your your body may just be telling you like i'm wanting to have a good solid group of friends and sometimes, you know, like, like you've moved 
you know, recently. And so sometimes when you move to a new area, there's this thing that happens. I moved a bunch as a kid and like, I'm, I'm just going to say this. I hope this doesn't sound harsh, but when you move to a new area, a new part of town, you move to a new school, often you end up with hanging out with all the weirdos first. And listen, I love weirdos, but some weirdos are a little too weird for me. So as you need to spend a little time kind of shift, you know, sifting through different people until you find your people. Good, solid people, Kyle. Good, solid hearts. Good, solid ethics. Good, solid boundaries. And a lot of people with loose boundaries, they do this thing where they're always changing their name. You know, loose boundaries in this case, like they're, you know, not wearing clothes, <laughs> you know, uh, they're getting, you know, they're, they're kind of have these fringe identities or they're trying to figure out their identity. And, and, and you can acknowledge like, that's not my cup of tea. That's not the club I'm wanting to be in. The nudist club, like I want to be in this spiritually mature club. Spiritually mature club. And I encourage you to say this to God, say this to life. Uh, he, and this actually relates to the uh, to John before, you know, with this question about these teachers. Like, I want a teacher who is spiritually mature. I want a sangha who is mature. I want a, a community who have done their work, or at least who are doing their psychological work. I want to be with people who value the truth. You know, like when I feel in a nudism, like oftentimes like when I met with people who play in those worlds, they say, I don't like wearing clothes because I want to experience being free. As people say the same thing, like I do drugs because it gives me a sense of freedom. It's like true freedom comes when we step back, way back into the depth of our being. Where we're not wearing a mask and it has an, it has nothing to do with clothing. True freedom is when we give up all of our thoughts and all of our identities. We be this space that is open, awake, and aware. And this space that is open and awake and aware, it doesn't need a fancy spiritual name. They may choose <laughs> to have a fancy spiritual name, but it doesn't need that. And so Kyle, my friend, I think what you're desiring is deeper relationships. And I believe, my friend, you're getting ready to move again. And so when you finally land, I'm going to invite you to say this prayer to God. Connect me. Connect me to my soul mates. And by soul mates, I want to use the word mate like the British use it, like Australians use it. Friends, my soul friends. I'm not talking about your one and only lover who you're supposed to travel lifetimes with. God, will you connect me with my soul mates, the true people who are meant to be in my life, who are here to support me and who I'm here to support, people who will meet me where I am on the spiritual path. Will you connect me with this? People who are deep, who are wide, who are connected to the truth. This is a good prayer for most of us. I, I once said this prayer because when I was on the path, it was funny. Uh, when I first was on the path, it was just me and my teacher. I didn't really, I, I had all kinds of friends, but I didn't have any spiritual friends at all just me and my teacher. And my teacher, he was, uh, you know, good 30 years older than me. And his students were all 30 or 40 years older than me. And I was just this young kid. And so at some point I said, God, like, I want to have some good spiritual friends. And it took about six months and God rearranged some things in my life. And then they started showing, showing up one after the, after the another. And now I've got so many, it's just like, they get mad at me <laughs> because I never have enough time for any of them, you know, because I never have enough time for any of them. And so, you know, Kyle, I encourage you to really send out this love to the world 
that you're wanting to give and you're wanting to receive from a place of death. And you just let people do what they're going to do. But if someone's making you really uncomfortable, it's probably not the people for you to be hanging out with. Probably not the right people. Uh, so anyways, uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, I'm just going to read one more comment and then we'll uh, if I call it right. Okay, this is from Don and Jan. Uh, Jan and I spent two years just recently with a teacher we both think was genuinely awake and had enormous shadow stuff he wasn't willing to look at. Um, he was an original member of the group. Uh, Craig is a part of a group for spiritual integ uh, integrity. I think he decided no one was high enough to hold him uh, to account, so he left. We felt we felt on and off through the whole two years that something was off, but didn't trust our intuition. The last day of the retreat we did, I felt the minute I entered his home that something was deeply off. Later, we found out that he was describing himself as a savior of the cosmos. We both felt that he had fallen much further from the path than he had ever had before. A great learning experience, ultimate lesson, as Craig is saying this moment is to listen to the God, listen to your wisdom. Yeah, and that's the thing is we're all given this gift of intuition. We're all given a, a, a you know, this center like in our lower belly, our hara, and it will tell you right from wrong, up from down, left from right. It'll tell you the way. It'll tell you the way. Now, most of us, we, we never really listen to our gut or we haven't been trained in how to listen to that voice. But instead, we listen to fear and we listen to hope. Or we give our authority away. Like we don't trust our own self. And so we listen to the voice of someone else. Now, the mistake most people make is, you know, instead of listening to their intuition, they look for their intuition and they hear a voice of fear. And normally, intuition doesn't speak to you through fear. It speaks to you through power, a very clear power. And in a clear power, like if you see, you know, if you have this, this sense, like something's off here, that's what it feels like. Something ain't right. But that's not fear. It's just a basic truth. Of like Something isn't right here. And sometimes it'll give you like a little bit of a fear response, like a clinch. And the clinching in your belly is like, your belly is telling you, pay attention to me. And when you start to pay attention, you just ask your belly, is this the truth? They'll say, no. This is not the truth. And when you see something that's not the truth, your job is to speak up and or to leave. To speak up and or to leave. Now, if it's with the teacher and you're getting a big, you know, reaction in your belly, like that means it's time to go. Whereas a proper reaction in your belly, if you're with a really good teacher, is your belly will relax and it will open further. It will relax and open further. There'll be a feeling of home to it. A feeling of home. Now, let me clarify this a feeling of divine home, divine home. Now, sometimes if we have any history of abuse or neglect or like some crazy power dynamic in our life, and our ego, like, like say our childhood family was a family of chaos and just an abuse. Sometimes when we meet that in the world, our ego is actually attracted to that. And there'll be a feeling of home, like, oh, I know this. I know this kind of thing. I, I'm kind of comfortable here because I knew it as a child. But that's not the kind of home I'm talking about. There's actually a reason the ego does that, is that it often attracts a repetition of the past so that the past can be healed. Unfortunately, uh, and this is why people like serial date abusive people, is you know, because they keep trying to work it out. But the problem is we're not going to work it out in that relationship. 
We're going to work it out in the aloneness of our own self. Now, if I go back to this feeling of home, the true feeling of home, when you're with a good teacher, good sangha, it'll just feel like this just makes sense. All of me is included here. All of me is welcome. There's love, there's peace, there's space, there's sanity, there's truth, there's depth, there's clarity. There's no, we're going to get rich quick here. We're all going to be enlightened in 2023, like right away. You know, it's not, not, you know, it's not going to be snake oil. There's just going to be this feeling of just depth to it. That this is universally good. All of me is welcome here. All of me is welcome. And I hope all of you, if you're here and you're resonating with what's here, are getting a big taste of that. So anyways, so much love to each of you. Uh, I, I will uh, let people know. I, I don't think I've said this just yet, but if you want to come to the retreat and you need a scholarship, uh, I'm always happy to give those out. If you're, uh, you know, if you legitimately need a scholarship for the retreat, uh, you can send me an email and I'm, I'd be happy to have you join uh, that way if you're feeling low on funds and that type of thing. Uh, if you're suffering in life, if you lost your job, uh, you know, sometimes we go through the dark night on the path. We just, we don't have much. And so, you know, that it's always a possibility for my live events for there to be a scholarship. Um, you know, what one time, I'm going to say this, I'm going to say something opposite. One time I was working with a fella and uh, I think I've told the story a couple of times. He came in to see me uh, for therapy and uh, he talked me down to like a quarter of my rate. And he was kind of a wheeler and dealer. And, uh, you know, we were having a session and he was telling me how he owned all these trailer parks and he owned all these campgrounds. And then he was buying his third house in Aspen. And I was like, why the heck am I giving <laughs> this guy a deal? <laughs> like, this isn't how a scholarship is supposed to work. But, you know, if, of course, uh, you know, some people are wheeler and dealers. If, of course, you need one, don't be afraid to ask. <laughs> but, of course, if you have, uh, you know, if you have, you know, all the funds, just, you know, pay the normal rate. But if you need something, you know, I want the door to be open. The door to be open to you. The door to be open to you. And don't hesitate, please. Don't hesitate. So, anyways, uh, so much love to all of you. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Good night, everyone.